Hey, Matt. Hey, how's it going? It's going great. Uh, sorry, hey. guys. I'm saying that I'm like turning my computer screen. I'm sure I'm making all the viewers <laughs> ill. I realized I was sort of out of frame. How's it going? <laughs> Things are good. Things are good. Uh, glad you could. Uh, I don't know. I guess I'm filling in for Bill. You are. You are filling in. I'm, I'm not going above and beyond here. You are. So kudos to you. <laughs> filling in for Bill who wants to get his on assignment. Ah. Do we know what his assignment is? We don't. He's all. He just says he's on assignment. I think he's at, at the beach or something, probably. But he says assignment. I don't ask questions. He's the senior, senior member of our of our uh, threesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, it's it's kind of uh, good though that that you and I do this because a lot of the action happening right now is on the Republican side. Yes. So I think we have a lot to talk about and. Uh, Let's dive in. This is the weekend blog, so I want to start with uh, the blogger Eric Erickson, of course, the prominent conservative blogger at redstate.com, who wrote a piece this week that got a lot of attention. This is before the debate. And he, uh, he says Mitt Romney is going to be the Republican nominee, and, the gener and his general election campaign will be an utter disaster for conservatives as he takes the GOP down with him and burns up what, uh, what it means to be a conservative in the process. And then later he added, uh, I'm starting to think I need to walk back my rejection of John Huntsman because I'm starting to think even he would be more faithful to the conservative, to his conservative convictions than Mitt Romney. You might remember uh, Aaron Erickson actually accused John Huntsman of being disloyal, not just to President Obama, but to America. So this is huge if he thinks that John... Huntsman uh, is maybe a better conservative than Mitt Romney. Uh, I got a lot of news, but um, what, what was your read on this? Well, my read on it was I, I think that it's it's too much to say that, you know, by nominating Mitt Romney, this, this would suddenly mean the death of conservatism. Um, I often go back to that, you know, a lot of the same folks that are criticizing him now are the very same folks that really liked him last time around when he was more positioned as the candidate of the right. Um, Opposed to John so, McCain, who they hated worse. Right, right. So, I mean, I don't know if it's just a change in the uh, in the alternatives or if it's that, you know, I, interestingly enough, you know, I don't necessarily think that Romney has, you know, um, the biggest thing that people are criticizing Romney about, he has not flip-flopped on at all. Uh, some people wanted him to flip-flop on his health care plan, and he hasn't. Um, so, you know, it's... I think, you know, this, this debate has been had before, you know, to what extent is, is Romney care uh, actually, you know, to what extent does that disqualify him from being considered a conservative? I think it depends on what your definition of conservative is. Um, I thought his, I, I thought what was funny was immediately after Erickson posted um, this post, all of a sudden, every, you know, the, the big statement that came out of it that everyone was tweeting about was, is this like a quasi endorsement of Huntsman? Should I, you know, should we... Is Huntsman for real? Uh, and 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 Erickson quickly then later tweeted, like, no, I think people are reading too much into my my Huntsman walk back. I still yeah, don't like him. Yeah. Um, and the post that that stuck out to me in response to this, um, I thought Connor Friedersdorf had an interesting post. His his take on this was that uh, part of the reason why folks don't think Rom thought Romney was conservative last time, but don't think he's conservative this time, isn't necessarily because his positions have changed between 2007 and now on a lot of things. I mean, there are, of course, some things where folks are finding some gray area, but the, by and large, last time, he was much more focused on the pandering to the right, the speaking right. the language of the right, the, the throwing out the red meat and the doing of the, the things that emotionally get the right excited about you, whereas Romney's clearly not been as interested in, in that tactic this time around. Um, meanwhile, Huntsman, who has a very conservative record, um, he has sort of never been in the business of throwing the red meat out to the base. Um, so Friedersdorf's whole post is, are we, dis are we going to define someone's conservatism by what they've done policy-wise or by how they comport themselves in a race? And he sort of blames Eric Erickson, uh, then, because Friedersdorf's not a big Erickson fan, um, for creating a culture where throwing out red meat and signals that you are conservative is much more rewarded than actually having a conservative record. And he thinks that this was sort of born out of the George W. Bush era, or Bush, despite doing an awful lot of spending and doing things that, conserv that are kind of anathema to conservatives, like No Child Left Behind, um, that these were things, as long as Bush was still throwing red meat out there every once in a while, uh, that it was okay. 
the, the, the conservative movement is placing more emphasis on style than on substance. And that's why someone like a Huntsman isn't getting perhaps the attention that he deserves given his record. Well, I think it's, uh, I think it's true that style trumps substance right now. And, and it's, it's, it's a certain type of style. It's you've got to be, you know, you've got to be tough. Um, and you've got to attack Obama. And that's the definition of conservative, essentially. Um, and it's kind of sad. I don't think it's fair at all to blame Eric Erickson for contributing to that. But I, but I do think it's a, a, a bit of a sad commentary on the state of, of conservatism. Um, what else in there? Uh, oh, I, I do want to bring up uh, Eric Erickson, because, you know, um, this is a, a blog type question. Uh, Erickson, his type of rhetoric, which I think is interesting. Um, I think there's a lot of hyperbole in there. Like, for example, everybody sort of mis, well, I don't want to say misinterpreted, but everybody, if you, if you read it at face value, of course you would have assumed that this was like a tacit endorsement of John Huntsman. I mean, I didn't necessarily take it to be that because I read Red State a lot, and I and I sort of know Eric's shtick, and I, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, but his style, which I think is over the top rhetoric. And uh, for example, when Eric Erickson, uh, when he basically says Mitt Romney is going to be the guy, I, I don't think that is like if Chuck Todd said that. You know, Chuck Todd would be doing analysis and and trying to make a prediction. I don't think Erickson is predicting. Despite what he says, I don't think he's predicting Romney. I think he's sending a warning flare out. I think he's uh, basically starting to sense that conservatives are uh, coalescing around Romney or at least accepting the fact that he might be as good as it gets and that Erickson is um, in predicting that Rom Romney will be the nominee is actually trying to scare conservatives into waking up and rallying around an alternative. That's how I interpreted his, his statement. And um, it is interesting because um, it's not exactly what he said. Uh, I don't know how to put it. Let me throw it to you and see if you, uh, if you agree and if you have any thoughts on this brand of like what I would call activist blogging. I think that what this is intended to do is to I think what Erickson is trying to to stop is conservatives who maybe Mitt Romney's not their first choice, but folks who are kind of going through the stages of grief and are now in the acceptance stage. Right. And they're saying, you know, Mitt Romney wasn't my guy, but first, my guy was Michelle Bachman, and she failed to do anything intelligent in these debates, and so then I moved to Rick Perry, and he bombed out. And then I moved to Herman Cain. And he has this scandal. And so I am feeling lost and feeling like I am trying to make my peace here. And so as I, I think what the point of this post is, is to, sh to shock people yeah. and to say, no, the stakes here are not just, you know, we need to try to beat Obama and he's perhaps our best guy, which is why in his post he sort of walks through a case for why even if Romney is the nominee, he doesn't think that he will beat Obama. So he's saying, take that off the table. Like, stop thinking about that. Well, let, let me ask you this. Romney Do you realize there is a longer term threat that he poses besides just maybe losing to Obama? Do you think I mean, he's... I mean, I disagree with that case, but I think that that's why he, he goes... I think that's part of the activism of this post, is that he's trying to, to get to shake folks out of any sort of um, settling that they might be in the process of doing while all these other candidates these last few weeks have started to implode. And the way this is written is very in your face. Do you, do you think that it's because he really wants to shake conservatives and warn them that Romney is winning? Or, or do you think this is partly self-promotion? How much of this is about getting his name out there um, versus getting a message across? Any sense there? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, his he's he's got a he's got a very big platform. He's got a contract with CNN. I mean, this is this is sort of you know be, being the guy with the defining post on what is what the conservative movement thinks about something is kind is kind of his shtick. So I mean, I don't know if this mm -hmm. necessarily is intended as like 
let's write a post that people who don't currently know who Eric Erickson is will, will have come across their radar and will go, ah, now I know who Eric Erickson is. Instead, I really think that he, I think that in a way I wonder if, if Romney wins the nomination against, you know, the, the sort of angry fury of conservative bloggers who dislike Romney, does this make the conservative blogosphere look like it actually doesn't have that much power? Like the establishment is right, that most Republicans are not where the bloggers are, that the bloggers are less powerful, that, that, that they're louder than they are powerful. Um, I think that that's why you would have a blogger trying to shake people up to make the case, if, if we don't win this thing, mm -hmm. then we lose. And I, I, I think that it, that's why he's saying, conservatism dies. Now, last time, though, I mean, I, I have to say, I mean, last time, and you mentioned Erickson, for all, Erickson, I think, at the end, uh, probably jumped on the Romney bandwagon, but um, but there were a lot of pro-Romney bloggers, like Catherine Lopez, The National Review, Hugh Hewitt at Town Hall, Dean Barnett at Town Hall. I mean, there were a lot of pro-Romney bloggers, um, and I suspect, I mean, Hugh and, and uh, Catherine Lopez are still blogging, um, I, mean, I suspect they're still very pro Romney, so I don't even know if it would be fair to conclude that just because Erickson and a lot of other conservative bloggers are anti Romney, that that uh, the blogosphere loses if he wins. I, well, I, and I absolutely agree with you, but I think the point that he's trying to make and why he uses these big statements like "conservatism will die" right. <laughs> is because he's trying to make the point like my my flavor of conservatism will die, and I believe that I'm right, and these other folks are, are milk toast moderates masquerading as conservatives, or they don't have their priorities straight, or they read Jennifer Rubin and agree with her, you know, I, I, I don't know, but I think that that's why he uses the big language, is, is to say, like, this is about uh, the place of bloggers like me, who are, are trying to hold the movement accountable, and trying to make sure that this party doesn't drift too far to the left, and are trying, he's, I mean, he's not really worried about the health and welfare of the Republican Party, and he says that repeatedly, but... Um, I, I think that if, if Romney becomes the nominee, then those bloggers that stood up very loudly and said, how can conservatives accept this guy? Um, I mean, do they wind up looking like a, like a fringe instead of where, I mean, with the whole Tea Party emergence, folks were saying, you know, has the, se has the center of gravity in the Republican Party shifted to the Tea Party, to the conservative bloggers? Um, you know, with Rick Perry announcing his campaign at a blogger convention, right? I mean, it sort of implies like even candidates are are, are, are trying to figure out, you know, to yeah, I don't think that is the blog community po politically impactful. I don't think that got enough post by Eric Erickson influencing voters in Iowa. I don't think that got enough NBC. play. You're right. I mean, he, uh, Perry announced at a blogger conference, and I, I don't think that got enough play. It should be huge. It's a huge deal for bloggers. I don't think it got enough. But, hey, uh, you mentioned Jennifer Rubin. Have you and Bill, because she's, I mean, Ben Smith at Politico wrote a big piece about her the other week. Yeah, we did all, we, that was our. <laughs> okay, so you guys did talk about her, because I think that's yeah. interesting. Well, uh, let me segue then. I know you've got some info on, uh, on Newt. Um, Jennifer Rubin, I guess, is not a big Newt fan either. And uh, at the debate Wednesday night, um, Gingrich uh, was asked by John Harwood about lobbying for um, Freddie, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. And, uh, you know, apparently uh, Gingrich is like, no, no, I never, you know, I never did that. Uh, I gave him advice I didn't take. Um, and Ruben has posted that transcript and then, um, you know, sort of, I guess, sort of mocking, you know, the, the parsing of what a lobbyist is versus a historian who's advising them. Um, so we'll see. I don't know. Uh, maybe if Perry's been fully dispatched, I don't think he has. But maybe if Perry's totally done, Ruben will turn her attention on on Newt Gingrich next. <laughs> <laughs> well, as as far as the Newt thing goes, um, there was a post by Rich Lowry that went up on Wednesday called "Why Not Newt," uh, and he starts with, "I know, I know, there are many reasons, <laughs> um, I, but I understand why he's getting a second look and popping up in the polls." Um, and he goes through and, and sort of says, you know, he doesn't have the executive experience of Perry. He's not as likable as Kane. Um, but he knows more and is better explaining what he believes. It's easier to imagine electing a former Speaker of the House president than someone who is head of a trade association. If the dynamic of the race is set up inevitably as Romney versus not Romney, Newt may have better odds than anyone else to be the not Romney. 
they think in general, and this is this is a theme I've seen bloggers and it, you know, I mean, if you look at Twitter during any debate, it's this constant chorus of, "Hey, Newt's doing really well. It's too bad it doesn't matter." Yeah. yeah. Um, but that generally, I mean, Newt's kind of saying, in many cases, he's saying all the right things, uh, but does he just come with too much? baggage and at a certain point i mean i really think there's the belief is that there will be romney and then there will be the not romney um the, 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 you know eventually people are going to come in fourth in iowa and realize it is just time to fold right. and when they do you know who does that all coalesce around i don't know if it becomes a newt versus romney race i don't know how that turns out um but i do think it's interesting that uh that as, as everybody has, has fallen out, it's, it's now Newt's turn in the musical chairs for who gets to be the not Romney. Right. Well, do you think uh, Santorum's turn is two weeks from now? Uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> this, by the way, I mean, this this is playing out in the blogosphere, too. I mean, people, you know, Michelle Malkin um, a few months ago was was like targeting Rick Perry over Gardasil and immigration. She's now turned her sights on Newt Gingrich. Mm -hmm. um, and she's got a post up today, of course, um, with with a picture of of Newt and uh, Nancy Pelosi sitting on a couch talking about climate change. I mean, that's the problem. Is that sort of baggage? I mean, once Newt becomes a viable um, a enemy, uh, someone who could threaten Mitt Romney, then all of a sudden, it's just he's got so much baggage, um, and, and including the ads he did with like Al Sharpton or whatever, or Newt Gingrich about climate change, or not with uh, Nancy Pelosi. I will say I did interview. Um, or uh, emailed with, is a better way of putting it, <laughs> an email interview with Craig Shirley today, the Reagan biographer, and he's writing a book called Citizen Newt, which is set to come out right before the Iowa caucuses. And he told me, uh, we are witnessing one of the greatest comebacks in American history, speaking of Newt. So uh, he is bullish about Newt. So there are clearly people who are believers, um, and there are people who are not. So... Well, and we'll I, I want to give a full news. disclosure. I, the firm I work for, I work for a pollster, David Winston, and he was Newt's director of planning in the late 90s and is, is a close buddy of Newt. So I am not personally involved in anything in Newt world. Um, but I just want to give that full disclosure as well to the viewers that, that you know, much as I like to think I'm impartial on this one, um, I, it, and I, and I, you know, I don't think that Newt personally for me, he's not really my candidate in this race. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting having seen I, you know, a lot of, I think one of the tweets that went out yesterday, this might have actually been Chuck Todd, you know, I might be remembering this wrong, um, but they, they tweeted that it's kind of ironic that, you know, Newt's staff left to go to Perry. Yeah. Now, if you're working yeah. for Perry, you're probably looking at Newt right now like, hmm, that, like, that would be the more attractive jump to make at this point. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't know. That, I think it, it's, what's been funny is that, you know, Romney has stayed in the front in the bright lights and people still haven't really landed a glove on it while all of these other folks right. as they rise up all of a sudden the bloggers kind of turn and, and aim and fire and then that right. person falls down well speaking but of Ron someone has been able to survive it despite the repeated choruses throughout the blogosphere of like how is this happening and speaking of someone who has been under fire we don't have, don't have to talk about herman cain's uh sexual harassment uh allegations but um Part and parcel of that has been this movement on the blogosphere to uh, get him to fire Mark Block, the smoking chief of staff. Uh, Michelle Malkin has a, a post up called Herman Cain's Worst Enemy. Uh, Eric Erickson today, uh, you know, on the Red State, uh, calling on Herman Cain to, uh, you know, fire uh, his team. Uh, he says last week J.D. Gordon, this is a communications guy for Kane, had a disastrous performance on a BlackBerry on Gerardo's show. His performance set the tone for Money News, all of which pointed out that your own communications vice president would not deny the story. Uh, we know that Mark Block, of course, uh, at one point accused Rick Perry's team of being behind the allegation leak to Politico. Then he later sort of walked that back. Mark Block then accused uh, or, or you know, said that uh, Josh Krauschar, uh, who used to work at Politico, was related to Karen Krausar, one of the accusers. It turns out Krausar doesn't even work at Politico anymore, hasn't for a couple years, and isn't related in any way to the accuser. And he went on national television and said this. 
Um, I think Ed Morrissey uh, at Hot Air uh, has voiced a uh, similar uh, statement. I, I had a post up at the Daily Caller yesterday where I interviewed some strategists, including Chris LaCivita, a top Republican uh, strategist, who said essentially that uh, this is amateur hour, that Herman Cain deserves better. So um, one of the interesting things on the blogosphere is, is essentially, you know, conservative bloggers have called on Herman Cain to, uh, to oust Mark block hasn't worked and he says he's not gonna by the way I, I think one of the things that one of the I mean what you saw as troubling or what Eric Erickson in his post saw as troubling is that you know if for, for Herman Cain his appeal was never that he's like the smartest guy in the room and has all the solutions but he tried to make the case well I'll surround myself with people right. who can handle this like uh, his economic advisor, Rich Lowry, who is not the same Rich Lowry as the one at National Review. Um, Nor is he an so, economist. <laughs> yeah. So by having all of the people around him sort of crash and burn, I mean, it really sucks the life out of that argument. Yeah. Of, I know how to put good people. Right, and, and because Kane often deferred saying, like, well, I'm not going to talk about what I'm going to do in Afghanistan. I will listen to the experts. Well... You know, or he would say, like, as a businessman, I bring the best people in. Well, it doesn't really seem to be true. And um, Herman Cain ver may very well be entirely innocent of all these allegations, but he is clearly running a bad campaign. Um, and uh, unconventional doesn't have to be a code word for amateur. But, uh, yeah. but it has been. Uh, it is interesting that these conservative bloggers are essentially staging the intervention. A public intervention saying you've got to have a better team, you've got to bring in some better people. I think Herman Cain should have had a, uh, a female, um, a, a well-spoken, you know, polished female um, spokesperson during the scandal might have uh, might have come in handy. Well, I think he used to he used to have a female uh, communications director, and she's now just taken a job on the Hill. I, I yeah, saw Ellen, pieces of that. Ellen Carmichael. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he, he probably could have used her help at this point. But what I, what's actually been interesting, and, and maybe I have just not come across this, and maybe you have, is I was thinking because that you know there was there there's this, you know a lot of folks out there who really like Herman Cain, um, that when these women made these allegations, that there would wind up being sort of a blogosphere witch hunt to like really go after these women, um, to figure out who they were and to tear them apart. And instead, I mean, I haven't really seen conservative bloggers trying to like disprove. Uh, the allegations against a hero. Instead, it's actually been the, the mainstream media that I think has been brutalizing these women. Um, or, I mean, you saw like Andrea Pizer, I guess, at, at the Washington Post, had, or not Washington Post, the New York Post, had like a really scathing column about um, Sharon, uh, yeah, I'm going to pronounce Bi it. Bialik or, yeah. Bi so, Bialik, Bialik. So um, you know, I mean, so the, these women are, are really under a lot of fire, whether it's it's the, the one woman being say, oh, well, she's, she's you know, basically going bankrupt and she's just doing this for money and attention, which coming out with Gloria Allred doesn't really help. Right. That and Kane, Kane also, though, and I thought it was a very risky strategy. It turns out, it, I don't think it hurt him, but he put out a uh, an email the day of his press conference basically pointing out all, you know, all of her, her bankruptcies and law she was a defendant in lawsuits and a paternity suit and she uh, had nine jobs in 17 years which actually isn't that many in today's world um, he really went after her and tried to discredit her and I thought he should have leaked it to me or a blogger or a reporter Politico yeah. or whatever I mean if you know what could have happened is Kane's oppo people give it to let's say National Review they write it vet it write it and then the story goes out, Kane's fingerprints are clean, and yet he, his people can say, Look, stuff's already coming out about her. I just saw what was it, National Review posted. I mean, I don't, That's how these things work. Right, That's I how understand. this whole deal works. Why do you want to be, like, he didn't have to be a part of it. He could have totally um, separated himself from the, the negative side of, like, dishing information on this woman. Uh, it turned out it didn't hurt him because the rules don't apply anymore, but... Um, thank God for him they don't, because uh, this could have really backfired on him. And it well, did. I, think, I think at this point, though, I mean, if you if you really like Herman Cain and you're sticking with him through this whole story, then the allegations about the uh, that the, the, the women are, are, you know, that, that they're 
that they just have made false accusations and bringing up all this credibility stuff about them isn't really changing your mind. On the other hand, if you were looking at Herman Cain and you were like, man, I liked you, but ugh, I don't know about these allegations. I don't know if this is really changing your mind. I think what's important is there's that there's got to be like a middle group of people who are the sorts of like bloggers who are sympathetic to Herman Cain, but on the other hand, are frustrated with his handling of this. Story. Oh, I think no, I think that is a huge contingent yeah. of conservatives and bloggers. Yes, I think that's like the most critical right. chunk. And I think even though, like for instance, what you just described, him coming out and saying, "Oh, I've, I've got all these facts about the women." Right. I mean, that's. Uh, you're, because that is, in a sense, a disqualifier as well. It's not yeah. just, is he innocent? It's, is this someone who can run a professional campaign, who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Barack Obama and run a professional organization? And uh, when, you know, in the big leagues, and, and that's probably, the answer to that is probably no. And it, it's not even as though, I, one of the arguments that I've heard from a friend of mine who's a big Kane supporter is, you know, look, in 2004, when he ran for Senate, he had the benefit of having a Kurt Anderson on his staff. Right. Uh, this time around, anybody who's a big fish and who's a real professional and knows what they're doing didn't go work for Herman Kane. They went to go work for someone else because someone else had a chance and Herman Kane didn't. So with Herman Kane kind of scraping the bottom of the staff barrel, you know, well, how might you be expected to have a professional operation? But I don't think that's a good excuse. I think if you're smart, you don't need... I mean, I think having experienced staff is fine, but it's not as though I don't know, you know, 30 different people who all could probably right. competently and run a presidential race. And, and that's why... Really I, working for yeah, and that's so. why I reject that. I think you're totally right. I, I disagree with that premise because there are so many competent people out there and uh, you can always bring them in later like Rick Perry did. I mean, Rick Perry went out and brought in some people, uh, you know, Kane could have done that. He could have, you know, campaigns grow, they evolve. Uh, he could have, you know, filtered out people, filtered in some more competent people. But there are so many uh, quality, quality people. I think it might be part of the ethos out there, which is to say, I'm going to run an unconventional campaign, and that means I'm not going to listen to any of these so-called experts because they're doing it the old way. Um, I think that might be part of it, that mm -hmm. it, being experienced and knowledgeable is in some way a, a, a minus. But my argument would be Herman Cain is unconventional enough for everybody. Like, he doesn't need, uh, he's, he's an inexperienced candidate. He doesn't need an inexperienced manager, too. Yeah. Why, why, not, <laughs> why not have some teamwork? Let's couple an unconventional candidate with someone uh, who knows what they're doing. And I'm, I'm reminded of Ed Rollins in the book Bare Knuckles in Back Rooms, where he says to Ross Perot, I'm not trying to run a conventional campaign. I'm just trying to run a campaign. <laughs> and I think sometimes that's that's the thing. It's like uh, it would be nice, you know, there is such a thing as the wise old men and women that, uh, that sometimes can be a Sherpa. Well, there's also common sense, too, that at a certain point, I, the, the way I think I've, I've described this whole story is it's like one of those uh, nuclear missiles that was developed in the Cold War to try to, for the U.S. and Russia to try to, like, get around uh, the, the nuclear limitations. They call them MIRVs. It's like a nuke with, like, a bunch of different warheads on it, and so it launches, and it just seems like it's one missile, but then it separates and it becomes lots of different really bad nuclear warheads uh, doing lots more damage than one would have done on its own, and I feel like this story became that because common sense wasn't right. applied at the beginning. No, I agree. They, they could have uh, they could have tamped this down. They could have come out. I mean, what they should have done, obviously, is bring this out themselves. I mean, Cain knew that he had th these two settlements. Um, he knows. We know he knows because he had approached um, Kurt Anderson in 2003 and said this could be a problem on my Senate race. Why didn't Cain uh, come to me or any number, John McCormick or Philip Klein, anybody? I mean. And, and, you know, six months ago, and tell the story, pick the timing, pick the reporter, frame it your way. Um, that's what you do on a campaign. He could have given a speech about tort reform and talked about frivolous lawsuits and worked in, you know, and I've even been a victim of this myself. You know, he could have brought it up and found a way. And then it could have been old news. Like, when Politico yeah. comes to him, he's like, what? I've been up front about this. This was reported six months ago. Why are you guys rehashing old news? Um, and, the, and, and the problem with, with a specific thing, allegations like this, is it would nearly be impossible for Herman Cain to prove his innocence. You right. can't prove yeah. your innocence in something like this. 
So your goal is not to prove that you're innocent by just denying it, denying it, denying it constantly and badly. I mean, you do deny it if you didn't do it, but then the story is now no longer, did Herman Cain do this or not do this? The story is, why does Herman Cain have a weird spokesman who goes and lies on TV all the time? And by why the way, the Herman spokesman... Cain that he didn't know about a settlement and then he did know about a settlement? And you know, yeah, all, all those things, the back and forth, and then the parsing, is it a settlement or an agreement? And then yeah. the, the smoking video, and, and his spokesman actually interestingly sued a reporter for sexual harassment. I mean, there's all these subplots that are so weird. Uh, but here's the thing. I wonder if he may have weathered the storm. I, um, the debate, the debate Wednesday night with Rick Perry. Um, I, I, I don't know if we're in the eye of the hurricane or if Herman Cain has weathered the storm. But I think there's a chance that it's over and that he survives this. What do you think? Okay. I think, like, the point that you made earlier, though, about how as soon as, for instance, as soon as Newt became the guy, all of a sudden Michelle Malkin turned her fire on him. Right, like, when Perry right. was the guy, Michelle Malkin turned her fire on him. I think that, you know, Herman Cain was the guy, and then I think after this, maybe there's a sense that he's just toast. Well, and, and because it, there's there's just no, there's no, not even that there's no salvaging this, but that it seems as though at every step of the way since these allegations, he's made the wrong moves. Yeah. So there's no way that he's going to make it and be viable through Iowa, so people just aren't paying. And there is a theory, there is an interesting theory that he doesn't start losing support until the scandal goes away. I don't know who came up with this theory, but it's interesting. Which is to say that as long as Herman Cain is being attacked, um, he is not seen as a candidate, he is seen as a cultural icon that conservatives must protect. And so they will rally to his defense. But the theory is that once time passes and the storm passes, he just starts shedding support because uh, his honor will have been defended, um, but no one really ex thinks he should be president anymore. You buy, you buy I've that? always wondered if his, if his support even was going to naturally begin to decline that um, you know, you can run on, on a 999 and get people really pumped about it for a period of time, but eventually, I mean, the, the host of blog posts that I've talked about on the show over the last month or so, all sort of like picking at 999 and saying, here's all the problems with it. Um, eventually, that kind of takes its toll, and so what's Herman Cain's next act? What, like, he can only say 999 so many times, and it didn't seem like Herman Cain had a substantive next act that he was ready to roll out. Right. Um, so in a way, maybe this has bought him time because nobody's expecting him to be talking about jobs in the economy because everybody's, like, you know, this is this is the Herman Cain topic du jour at the moment. Um, but I think, you know, whether the scandal happened or not, he needed to have a next chapter of some kind of substance right. to keep people in. And I, don't, I don't, didn't see any evidence of that happening. And I think eventually people were going to tire of him and it was going to be somebody's turn anyways to move up into the non romney spot. Uh, so, I know we're going to have a, an abbreviated TWIB this week. Uh, you want to cut it there, or do you want to talk Mitt Romney? I'll, let, I'll leave it up to you. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I think the last thing that I was going to say is, you know, if we talked a little bit about Rick Perry. And he's, okay. the, he's the story that I think is more interesting this week, um, given the, the outcome of the debates. Um, there's Byron York had an interesting post this morning at the, at the Examiner where he was talking about how um, you know, is like is Perry done? Is you know, if you were on Twitter last night, if you missed the debate, you could be forgiven for thinking that Perry actually just died up on yeah. stage. The conventional um, wisdom on the clip and watching the clip is incredibly uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, anyways, but Rick Perry had this very bad moment where he kind of stumbled. In isolation, wouldn't have been so bad, but it fed a narrative that he's just not so bright, not into this. And Byron York's post was pretty interesting because he sort of runs through Rick Perry's schedule in all of the places that he's been and has he been going to these early states. And it actually doesn't look like Perry has been, you know, going to 18 events a day. Like you expect somebody to mm -hmm. I mean, you expect somebody to be kissing every baby in the state of Iowa at this point in the game. And it looks like his schedule was a little more, like there were, like there were whole days when it, you know, there was kind of nothing. And, um, and he, he sort of makes the case that if Perry got talked into this race and wasn't fully prepared to run for president, it's a really lousy time to start crafting policy positions while you're supposed to be in kissing baby mode. That, that now is not the time in the race for you to be a student of public policy, that now is the time for you to be shaking hands and eating fried chicken out at, you know, at, at VFW halls. So I, 
I, I wonder to what extent there you've seen any of this from other bloggers that there's a frustration similar to the Herman Cain frustration like Herman we really like you why are you running a bad campaign <laughs> that same frustration being echoed for Perry hey Perry we like you why can't you just keep it together and, and do this the right way yeah I think it's um it's really been surprising how the campaign has floundered um I think there was a big expectation that he would do well. I think everyone's surprised that debates have played the, the role that they've played. Um, normally, I don't think they're this important in primaries, and they seem to be the most important thing. It's like retail politics doesn't matter. Fundraising doesn't matter. It's all about debates and wholesale. And it, like, that defies everything we know about Iowa and, and New Hampshire, and maybe maybe things get normal again. Um, oh, you know, Maybe Iowa ends up being about organization and money and, and the debates don't matter. I, I don't know, you know, when when we get closer. But as of now, debates matter and Rick Perry's a bad debater and he's had bad debates and he had a horrible debate Wednesday night. Um, the convention, I will say, the conventional wisdom on Twitter, if you were on Twitter when that moment happened, everybody was pronouncing him dead. And I think that, now, let me say, it was a very, very bad moment for him you're right that, and that it feeds into a narrative. People already think about him, and it's, it's devastating. But I'm just not sure that it's the end for him. Like, I, I feel like the uh, reports of his death are exaggerated. Um, and I, I feel and like it was overall too. Uh, there was, a little bit. Now I'm, I can't find the post. I had it up on my screen. I'm not supposed to have the internet browser open while we're doing this show. I got like 10 up. I mean, they tell oh, me. Oh, okay, good. I'm, they I'm always not tell me don't do it, and I always do it. Um, there's a post I saw. Oh, gosh, Quite the I can't power. find this. It's by by Drew who, but Drew who from Ace of Spades, but it's not posted as Ace of Spades. Where he says like that that now less than. So you don't know who this is. The, you can't remember. Pardon? You're saying that you can't remember who who this is. I it's I, it's I think I'm pretty sure that I'm. I'm just playing John Harwood here. I think oh. John Harwood. <laughs> here's the thing. I think I feel like Rick Perry like almost escaped, and then John Harwood was like. So, but is, is it really the EPA? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. I, and I, I felt bad for him because I, I've made, I, you know, I've been on the show and I've done that many times. Like, ah, oh, there's yeah. a blogger. Shoot, I read a lot of blogs yeah, today. It was, uh, it was Drew from uh, Ace of Spades. That, that's it. <laughs> um, but, uh, so I felt bad for him. I think that what what this post then said was that the uh, that thinking Rick Perry is dead is uh, is, is so, so done. So yesterday, <laughs> today is now... This is actually the thing that is going to jumpstart Rick Perry, oh, yeah. oddly enough, because he's now he's doing this Letterman thing. He's going on the Daily Show, like that. He's taking this sort of weird strategy of he's owning it. He's not stepping back. He's not saying like, I made a mistake. Let's but let's move on. I'm gonna talk about jobs, which you know I think yeah, he probably should have said I made a mistake. Now let's talk about jobs. Right. But if he's gonna go on and miscount things on David Letterman and just sort of like eat it up and endear himself to yeah, the, the the portion of the Republican primary electorate that doesn't care that he flubbed on stage. I mean, hey, it's, this uh, could be an interesting strategy. We'll you're see. right, and they're handling it about as as well as you could possibly handle this. They're 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 smart. They're being funny, uh, and and there is a post. Uh, what's Grace Weiler at Business Insider uh, has a piece titled "Rick Perry's Collapse Is the Best Thing That Could Have Happened to Him." So <laughs> there is unconventional wisdom out there that uh, this is somehow good for Rick Perry. I don't know that I would go quite that far either. Um, I think I'm somewhere in the middle. It was very bad, but uh, I don't know that it's the end of the world. So well, it definitely changes the expectations game in that I think Perry can now survive coming in third in Iowa and, and keep the train on running, you know, because because people – at this point, because he's doing so badly in the polls, yeah. because these debates aren't going so well. The only thing I could say about um, that is Perry, it would have been better for Perry had he gotten in early, bottomed out early, and came back early. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Like, in 2007, John McCain hit his nadir in, like, June. And he had six months to make a comeback to New Hampshire. We're in November now. Yeah. Now, doesn't mean it can't be done. John Kerry in November of 2003, um, I think, was a laughing stock, as I recall. Um, but it's not a lot of time to be hitting yeah. rock bottom. <laughs>
So. Yeah, I uh, I don't know if I mean, but but he certainly has the money to come back, yeah. and he's the only one that's up on the air in Iowa right now, I think. So. Right. The problem though is he's up on the air, um, but he has to because of the uh, because of his debate problems. He has to keep running positive ads, so yeah. he's he's really the 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 money is basically like treading water. It's keeping him alive, but it's not really advancing him. Is the problem? Yeah. So, but uh, anyway, good talking to you. As good always. talking to you too, Matt. We should do every once in a while do a Republican or a conservative right side of the blogosphere. Uh, the weekend blog. So I like this. I like this because yeah. there's there's only so many times that I can I can berate Bill for Occupy <laughs> Wall Street. So <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, this was fun. Let's do it again sometime soon. You got it. Have have a good one, and uh, we'll see you all back here next week on the Week in Blog. Ciao.